Well, let's go ahead and get started. And I think people will trickle in as we, as we go. So let me share my screen. And Anne, since I will no longer be able to see the participants or the waiting room, just let me know if, uh, interrupt me if we need to, if we need to pause at any moment. Will do. Okay. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. And I'm Jessica Joyce. I'm one of the facilitators of the working group and joining me today facilitating is Anne Hayden. I'll let you introduce yourself, Anne. Hi everyone, Ann Hayden. I work at Manomet and am just delighted to be part of this group and to see all your pretty faces. Awesome. Today, um, I'm not sure, well, we at least have a few harvesters on so far and I know that most towns have waived the conservation points for this year, but if anyone is hoping to get them for this meeting, uh, just send me an email and I'll work with your warden to see if we can make that happen. Uh, otherwise, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. And, and we did talk about doing introductions if we had um, a smaller amount of folks on the meeting. And, what do you think about going ahead and just spending a few minutes doing that? I think it's a great idea. Um, do you want to call on people and, and remind them they'll need to unmute themselves? Yeah, let's do that. Um, and I'll just go kind of in the order of my screen and let me know if I miss anyone. I have uh, Kevin. And if you unmute yourself, I haven't gone over the Zoom logistics yet. You got it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Oliver. I'm a over 15 year member of the Yarmouth, North Yarmouth Shellfish Conservation Committee and an over 20 year harvester in the Yarmouth town. Thanks, uh, Bridie. Hi, everybody. I'm Bridie McGreevy. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Communication and Journalism at the University of Maine. And I'm also a project lead with the Maine Shellfish Learning Network. Ari. Hi, uh, I'm Ari Contarado. I am uh, an anthropologist researching place-based identity here in Maine and uh, interested in how uh, that's uh, impacted by shellfish communities. And so I'm happy to be here. Great. Uh, Marianne, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I'm Marianne Nafe. Uh, I think it's down as Ho Conservation Commission there. However, I'm also a representative, uh, representative on the um, Marine Resources Committee as well. And noticing we don't have any harvesters here. I'm the only one. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I'll be in a position to take notes and pass it along at our meeting next week. Thanks, Marianne. Ashley had written saying that she was going to come. I'm not sure if she's a harvester or not. But she I is, but I'm not sure with the weather now. I mean, I don't see anybody. Yep. I know. I think the weather is going to be a, a tricky one tonight. Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining us. Carissa. Um, hi, I'm Carissa Aoki. I'm an ecologist um, in the Environmental Studies Program at Bates. Thanks. Uh, let's go to Nate. We have three. Hi, uh, I'm Nate. I, uh, I'm a commercial lobsterman and clamor in Scarborough. And, and oh, Nate, you're breaking up a bit. Well, we'll let on Nate. The, uh, Scarborough Shellfish Commission. Great. Nate, you are breaking up a little bit. Nate is in Scarborough. He's the chair of the Scarborough Shellfish Commission. He's also a member of the Working Group Steering Committee. Um, Madeline, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Madeline Drip. Um, I'm an AmeriCorps member, and I'm serving with GPCOG, but I um, am helping out with the uh, Shellfish Working Group on their uh, database project. 
Thanks. I see uh, Jay, Representative McCray, if you want to introduce yourself. You just have to unmute. There you go. Sorry, I had to find myself. Hi, I'm Jay McCright, and I'm in the legislature representing Harpswell West, West Bath and part of Brunswick in the House. Thank you. Um, I see a Ruth here. If you can unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Okay, we can come back to you as well. Um, and then I also see Randy Hamilton. Do you want to introduce yourself if you can unmute? Hi. <laughs> I, uh, I'm uh, I, uh, a shellfish harvester and uh, I grow a few oysters as well. Great. Thank you. Um, Ari, we have two Aris from DMR. If you could introduce yourself. Hi everyone, Ari Leach here. I have some spotty service, so I'm gonna keep my video off today. Okay, thanks. All right, Ruth, uh, did you wanna introduce yourself? Okay, I think we have one more and I don't see a name here, um, but if anyone hasn't introduced themselves yet, if you wanna unmute yourself. Um, I haven't. Sorry, I have not uh, introduced myself. I'm Lisa Marginelli. I'm on the Shellfish Conservation Commission in um, Arousic. Great, thank you for joining. Is there anyone else who I missed? Well, it looks like Ben Tupper joined us. Oh, Ben, we're just doing quick introductions. Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Ben Tupper. I'm with the uh, Yarmouth Shellfish Commission. Thank you, Ben. And Marissa, we're just doing introductions, um, name and where you're from. Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa McMahon, and I'm the director of the fisheries division at Manama. Awesome. Thanks. All right. I think I got everyone. Um, and let me know if I, I missed anyone. And that actually was great because now we have, everyone can get the, the introduction. So I'm going to dive right in here. And is everyone seeing my screen? Right now you should be seeing a quote. Sorry. Awesome, okay, great. And I'll go over Zoom logistics in just a few slides. Uh, first, I just really wanted to thank everyone for showing up today. I realized that uh, these are hard times with too many virtual meetings and especially when we're craving in-person interactions that I just appreciate you showing up and having a seat at the table so your voices can be heard. I was reading to my daughter and she had a bookmark with the Coretta Scott King quote that I liked and I thought it was fitting for the working group. So I just thought I'd share that. And I think everyone is joining by computer so I don't need to read <laughs> the slides out. Um, but this one just resonated for me that the working group is all about the community and the people who participate in this. For those of you who haven't joined a working group meeting yet, uh, this is really our second year. And I just wanted to reiterate that the purpose of the working group is that there's strength in numbers and that things are, are changing really fast in our environment and that there are certain ways that we can work together to address these issues, sharing information, best practices among towns in Casco Bay. Oops. For the agenda for tonight, I am going to go over some meeting logistics next, and then we'll get right into looking back on the last year, which spanned the calendar years of 2019 and 20. Then we're going to turn it back over to all the towns who are here today to share what you've been working on, and then get into a group discussion to plan for next year briefly talk about announcements and then next steps and we'll wrap up by 5.30. So just a few uh, logistics and then we'll dive right in. 
you can already tell, I think everyone's been good with the muting or muted upon entry, but you do have the ability to unmute yourself, which we'll be able to do during the discussions. If you have a question or comment, you can use the chat box, which is right at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you hover, you should see a chat icon that looks like a dialogue box. So at any time where we're not having an active discussion and you have a question or comment, feel free to pop it in that box and we'll read it for you. When we do have discussion, we'll review the raise your hand feature, which uh, would either be at the bottom of your screen or if you click on the participant icon in that panel, then you should see the raise hand feature as an option. Again, I don't think we have anyone on the phone, so I won't go over those details. The speaker view is usually the, the default view, which will show whoever's talking in a, a larger picture, and that's when there isn't a presentation. Gallery view is in the top right corner of your screen. There should be a box with a bunch of little boxes inside it. If you click on that icon, then you'll be able to see everyone here today. We also wanted to let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, for the folks who couldn't make it, we are going to post it on the website. So I think that's it. Um, Anne, is there anyone who's joined that missed the introductions that we can just let introduce themselves before we get into the content? I think John Crowder. Okay, John, do you want to unmute yourself and just share your name and affiliation? Yeah, John Crowder with the University of New England, just interested in listening. Great, thanks, John. And you might have seen in the chat that the the uh, mysterious Ruth is Ruth Indrick from oh, Felt. Great. She doesn't have a, a um, microphone. Okay, so Ruth Indrick from Kennebec Estuary Land Trust, and she does a lot of work with the, I think, the West Bath and some of the committees out there. So I, and um, and I can't see the chat box right now in my view. But I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Anne um, to take us through the look back from last year. Um, thanks, Jessica. Um, what a year it's been. Have we all been saying that all year? Um, but from the working group perspective, we've, we've gotten a lot done. Um, and I'd first like to recognize our steering committee members who've, you know, helped um, Jessica and me to figure out what's, um, what the working group can do that will best serve the needs of the um, shellfish community here in Casco Bay. So we have Paul Plummer from Harpswell, um, Kevin Oliver's on the on the um, the meeting with us today from Yarmouth, Nate Orf also on the meeting uh, from Scarborough, Bob Ernest from Shabig, and Terry Watson from Phippsburg. We managed to have a couple of in-person meetings. I know it seems like a long time ago. Um, and then transition to a virtual meeting in April. And uh, it went so well that we had confidence to, to do another one and here we are. We had uh, all, told, all told participation of it, our three meetings of 77 attendees, some double counting there because people came to more than one meeting. And um, a big boost uh, to our efforts came courtesy of, of Bates College. We had three undergrads who worked with us in the spring, were a huge help to stayed on and uh, worked with us over the summer. So we're grateful for that. And I think with that, I'm gonna turn it, oh, communications, missed that part, um, which Jessica did all the hard work on this. She launched a web page. Um, which I think you all have a, a link to it um, where you can find all of the materials that have been um, that we've put together and uh, we also um, send out regular newsletters and if you're not on our email list then um, uh, let us know and we'll make sure you get added to it and I think with that it's back to you Jessica. All right thank you Anne. I wanted to cover a few of the resources that were developed over the last year that all came from suggestions at working group meetings and with our steering committee helping to narrow them down. And there's a few people that are going to help me share these resources as well. The first one that I will mention is back in April 
um, which if some of you were at that webinar, you probably saw the presentation from our Bates uh, students, Josie and Natalie. They put together a really great guidance document on managing multiple species of shellfish. Uh, and what they did is they looked at different case studies from four states, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maryland, and Washington, and just looked at what they did from different um, avenues of harvester participation, research, and licensing to help guide some of the municipalities in Maine who are struggling with adding in different species like quahogs and how to actually manage those in your ordinance and in your program. That is available on our website along with the executive summary. Uh, the quahog uh, restoration guidance document uh, was released this summer and that highlights several local case studies of municipal conservation and aquaculture projects to restore quahog populations. Uh, includes best practices, cost, and other information for towns looking to pursue similar projects. And I was hoping that Ben Tupper from Yarmouth uh, could speak a little bit to how their committee utilized this resource. If you want to unmute yourself, Ben. Yes. And is it possible for me to share my screen? I have a picture to share. Oh, sure. Just make you a. All right. Can you do that, Jessica, or do I need to do it? I can. Oh, let's see. Spot allowed to record. I think you would need to make him a co host, which I'm not seeing in my. It's done. There you go. Should be able to go, Ben. Great, I hope you can see uh, this plot. Um, it's for three different towns and the data comes from the, the state. Um, and Kevin, Oliver, if you wanna um, raise your hand, if you wanna correct me on anything I misstate, please do so. Um, so the state recently started producing, uh, uh, making landings data available through um, an interactive web page. They called it the landings portal and the URL is at the top of this document. And I was uh, <clears throat> wanted to share this with you just to provide some context of why we're interested in looking into opportunities to expand or promote some of the other species that, um, that we in Yarmouth manage. So on the left-hand panel, you see for Brunswick, a plot of years along the bottom and then value per harvester. So this is the total uh, value, um, regardless of, of exactly the method for uh, harvesting, um, divided by the total number of licenses that the state kept track of. So, and as you go from left to right, we have Brunswick and Freeport and Yarmouth. And then the different colors represent um, the different species that at least in Yarmouth, the commission regulates. And the one in particular on the right-hand panel you see in green, um, that's all soft shell clams. And so to forgive my, uh, my poor pun, but we've got all our clams in one basket in the sense of, we seem to be only doing commercial activity in one realm. And we're not taking advantage of the fact that maybe, maybe there's other opportunities out there. The other thing to keep in mind um, is that in Yarmouth, most of that harvest happens through depuration. So if the decision is made not to have depuration come to town, the opportunities to dig for some of our uh, local harvesters goes away. And so we have really tough years. So uh, we have a lot of intense pressure just on one species. So we were interested in diversifying. And uh, so when we saw <laughs> Brunswick's results over on the left-hand panel, and we see quahogs skyrocketing up as a result of their efforts to promote um, a different species and the utilization of other species. We jumped right on it. So we, um, we, we took a look at the, at the report that Jessica just mentioned. We invited Dan um, to come down and speak with us. And uh, we're, we're interested in pursuing that. We're also at the same time trying to come up with a larger strategic plan for how will we promote all of these species to make it possible for harvesters to, uh, to make a decent living out there and not have it all come down to one particular species, which honestly feels vulnerable. 
So I, I guess that's all I have to share on that particularly. We're just starting um, to look at it. And uh, I think if, if we could have asked the same question a year from now, I would hope that we'd have a more concrete plan we could lay out and share with folks. Thanks, Ben. It's really neat to see those data for the specific species and towns. So thank you for sharing that. And I know Dan uh, Devereaux was going to talk about his contributions to the report, but Ann, I don't think he's on, right? So we'll, we'll circle back if he joins. Uh, I think there's a lot of folks out plowing and shoveling right now. So uh, next up, let's talk milky ribbon worms. And this is another guidance document that uh, the base students put together and it was a literature review. So basically they searched all existing uh, research that was published and even a uh, non-published paper, which sometimes are referred to as, as white papers or gray literature and looked at everything from life history to predation and mitigation. And unfortunately where that landed was that um, any large scale mitigation method for milky ribbon worms has yet to be developed. But through that process, their professor, Carissa, who I'm gonna to turn to next, had an idea that she is currently pursuing uh, that I thought you all might be interested in. So Carissa, if you can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so following up kind of, I guess, on the work that Josie and Natalie did, um, we started to think about, you know, how could we carry the work forward? Um, so we had sort of, we have a couple of different arms of this project. So one of which is now done, I had a thesis student, um, Oakley Elfstrom, who spoke to, I think at least one person who's on this meeting. Um, and she interviewed a handful of harvesters just because we sort of realized that as kind of people who study the science, we're not out there anything close to the number of hours, obviously, that harvesters are out there over the course of your lifetimes. And so we were really interested in hearing just like what have people observed and, you know, could these observations that have been made in people's experience be used to help guide questions that we would then ask from the scientific side. So um, I actually haven't graded Oakley yet, but it's in my hand and I'm going to read it soon. Um, but it, from what I've spoken to her about, it, it looks like it dovetails quite well with some other things that we were already planning on doing. Um, so Jessica, you and I went out for sort of a little pilot day of sediment sampling, um, just to kind of see what kinds of differences there were, what kind of variation there was, um, both in terms of just general habitat, where are there more worms, but also how variable is the sediment from place to place. Um, and so that was sort of one component of it. And then um, we're still just kind of wrapping up the lab techniques uh, to go with that. But I anticipate we'll be done with that probably by the end of January. And then the hope is that next summer we'll be able to send out some students to collect um, more samples from a variety of different locations um, in the area. And we hope to be able to impose on everyone's expertise again for good places to go. Um, and so that's one component of it that I hope to have students involved in. And then um, I think there's also room to do some kind of arena type experiments in marine aquariums. So I'm sort of hoping I can get a student also interested in that. But it, as it turns out, there's um, a lot that we don't know about the general ecology of these creatures. Um, and so hopefully we can learn more about their ecology so as to devise you know, hopefully maybe plans for mitigation in the future. Thanks, Carissa. We're really thankful to you and all your students for helping out in many ways. So the, the next project is really just available starting uh, today. We posted some materials that are informational resources for town councils or board of selectmen. And we developed outreach resources, including a presentation and a handout for shellfish committees to deliver to their town councils uh, to help inform their decision making. And um, Kevin Oliver, I'm going to put on the spot because he told me he really likes public speaking. And, um, and this was his idea. So he's going to tell you about this resource that is newly available. 
Evening, everyone. If you uh, didn't catch it earlier, my name is Kevin Oliver. I'm a shellfish board member of the North Yarmouth Yarmouth Shellfish Commission, 20-year um, harvester and a member of the, the work group. Um, one of the things that we discussed when we were working through some of these work group meetings is how do we how do we benefit the local towns? And one of the things that had come up during this process was the ability to get information out that um, a, a lot of people weren't sure where it was. We'd spend a lot of time in our shellfish board meetings over the years saying, geez, I wonder what, what this other town does, or um, you know, I wonder what the numbers in Harpswell are this year, or how is Freeport dealing with the green crab? So we started to have this discussion about how do we centralize this information and provide a good service for all of the towns in the Casco Bay region. So um, a, a number of discussions took place and, and a template has been designed to provide a lot more information, not just to the shellfish boards, but also a way to get this information up to the town council members who, if, if you guys have worked with municipalities in the past, you'll see that uh, every couple of years, we have new sh new board members on the town councils and the board of selectmen. And how do we get information to these individuals to explain to them the importance of the shellfish industry in their town, the ecology of their town, um, the importance economically, the families that depend on this information. Um, so thanks to the work group, we have designed a way to kind of centralize this information and be able to customize it for your town to provide information to your municipalities to centralize this and to do presentations um, and and we look forward to rolling this out amongst many of the local towns and looking forward to their participation in customizing something for their town and, and harboring and uh, just a place where we can all get to this information easily. So I wanna personally thank Ann Hayden and Jessica Joyce for um, organizing this work group and, and, and keeping it orchestrated. Uh, these have been a very tough year um, and, and they deserve a lot of the credit for this. And I wanna also thank the Bates students. They've been instrumental in putting this together um, and we should all thank them. And to use this information going forward, just reach out to the work group and uh, everybody should take a moment to explain to their town councils how important this is gonna be going forward and, and the information and the resource that are being provided to their municipalities is, is really important. And, and we should all take advantage of it. Um, just knowing more about what's going on in the Casco Bay region is, is gonna be critical, not only to harvesters like myself moving forward, but to generations to come. Um, and I just want to uh, um, express my pride in, in helping to get this to be pulled off and I look forward to putting in any little polishing touches that are needed going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. That was great. The last project that we have I'll before take we you up on that, Kevin. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you guys have to keep in mind I'm I'm not a very good public speaker. Um, you know, I, I I don't enjoy the limelight more often than not. I prefer to remain anonymous, but I do want to give the credit where the credit is due. And and Anne and Jessica have been instrumental in holding this work group together. Thank you, ladies. Yeah. Well, thank you. I don't think Kevin's missed like any but one meeting. And we have a lot more steering committee meetings than we have working group meetings. So yeah, thank you for all that, that you've done too. Um, so we have one more project that's actually just getting started. Uh, and I'm gonna mention that and then we'll turn it back over to the towns to share what's going on. And I'm gonna put Nate Orf on the spot because this was actually his idea to look at creating a database uh, for the communities. Nate, if you just want to introduce this. Yeah, hi guys. It's uh, it's cool to see so many new faces along with familiar faces. Um, so the database idea is sort of just an initiative that would like create a, you know, a culmination of all the best practices and everything that are being, you know, utilized in the municipalities in the area. Um, 
you know, there's so many different variables that conservation commissions control, whether it be like, you know, their engagement to water quality testing, the licensing, the conservation years. There's so many things and there's so many stakeholders that creating a document just to basically do what Kevin was saying is to, you know, allow other municipalities to see how other places are doing it, what's working for them, what's not working for them. Just, you know, compiling everything that's good in order to improve practices everywhere, just to really learn from each other. Um, you know, and the best thing about it, I think, is there's no there's no bad aspect of it that could possibly happen. If there's going to be benefits somehow, and it's, you know, it's going to help put things on paper for, you know, even the next round of uh, stakeholders that, you know, have an interest in this that aren't at these meetings and stuff. It's just going to keep that knowledge there to be utilized for time to come. Thanks, Nate. And we're right now in the phase that we're doing a needs assessment. And all that means is a fancy word for, we're figuring out what data and information are available and what people would want. And if there are any gaps trying to address those. So um, one of the things that we'll be reaching out to all of you in the town committees in January is gonna be a survey that's gonna help us identify what kind of data and information you would use to better manage uh, your shellfish flats. And I also just wanted to introduce our uh, fellow who, for those of you who are in the introductions, you met Madeline um, Tripp, who is, maybe I'll just let you introduce yourself again in your role with this project, Madeline. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, hi everybody, I'm Madeline. Um, if you weren't here when I introduced myself earlier, I'm an AmeriCorps, AmeriCorps fellow, um, but I'll be helping the Shellfish Working Group um, with their needs assessment for the database project and um, also in other roles, whatever really needs doing to um, make this database happen and to get this information to, out to the uh, municipalities. So I'm happy to be working with y'all. Yeah. Thanks. And, and if you couldn't hear that Southern twang, um, she's joining us from North Carolina, just moved here. And this is, I think, her first nor'easter. So <laughs> I was so excited. The snow is so beautiful. It's like real snow, not like what we have in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, thanks, Madeline. So that wraps up um, our look back on the last year and also one project that's going to bridge a couple years. Um, so right now, I'm going to, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but we will have plenty of discussion time later, so we can talk about these more if folks are interested, but I'm going to turn it over to Anne right now um, for our, our town sharing, and I'll, um, I'll get the screen up to Anne for you. Thank you, Jessica. This is, um, that was really interesting to have the different presentations. Um, uh, so thanks to those of you who um, who um, participated. That was great. So now we're going to turn to town sharing, which is um, one of our favorite parts of our working group meetings, where we just go town by town. We ask um, towns to, uh, if you have more than one representative on the meeting, uh, just one of you speak to the um, these questions that Jessica put up there. You know, what is the current focus of your committee? Uh, what are the obstacles to addressing the shellfish um, community's needs in your town? And um, what is one shared topic or issue you'd like the working group to consider focusing on in 2021 that meets the criteria, which are going to pop up here in a second, um, benefit more than one community. Uh, we could accomplish within the span of a year. Um, is feasible with a largely volunteer effort. Um, we do have um, undergrad interns, as we've learned, who will come out and help us. And Jessica and I and um, Marissa, my colleague at Manomet, um, can help out as well. And then, um, can it have a? Does it have a reasonable uh, equipment budget, and not require a huge amount of outside funding? So. With all of those um, restrictions on the uh, shared topic, let's let's uh, 
just go through the towns. Um, and I think I've got a list of who's represented here. And I want to start with um, Scarborough. Nate, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah, I can go first. Um, so we haven't really had too many meetings since COVID began. Um, we just kind of got all our ducks in a row. We just recently met and we voted to approve everyone's conservation year. So everyone got their conservation time for the year just because there is no way to orchestrate in-person projects, you know, crab kills and uh, surveys this year. So we're kind of bummed that we're going to have a lapse in our survey data. We uh, just tried to start up a new survey program last year. We recently required all of our uh, licensed harvesters to participate in four hours of survey work a year. So we're just going to be uh, getting a little later start in that project than we were anticipated. But I think we're uh, in the same page. We're monitoring the water quality, making sure everything's good. Um, that's about it I can think of. And one topic I would like to address <clears throat> with other towns is just uh, I really want to find a way to make conservation work the most efficient possible because uh, I feel as though like um, green crab trapping, for example, is we don't really know the efficiency. So there's like, you know, it would be nice to figure out what actually makes the biggest difference. So when we're actually, you know, dedicating man hours to it, we are doing the most possible benefit for our resources. And uh, I think that's about it. Oh, thanks, Nate. That's, um, I wrote that one down as a great working group uh, topic. Um, all right, let's go up to Yarmouth. And I don't know, Kevin, do you want to present for Yarmouth? Well, I can mention a couple of things. Uh, much like with some of the other municipalities, um, you know, our meetings have been very spotty. Uh, we've had no surveys this year, like Nate had mentioned. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to have that break. Uh, right now, one of the focuses that we're working on, like Ben had alluded to earlier, is, is the diversification of resources in our town. Um, that's, that's certainly something that we're spending some time looking into. Um, you know, one of the obstacles in addressing the community needs in our town is to, is to find the, the best way of, of documenting and, um, you know, really figuring out exactly what resource we have where and in what numbers, um, moving forward in a, in a steady way. Um, you know, once we get back to doing some more surveys, that might, might be helpful. If there's anything that anybody can help provide to come up with a standard surveying methods moving forward, that, that might be some good information to share with the local communities. Um, but if, um, if Ben and Judy have anything to add, we'd love to hear from them. Ben and Judy, anything quick to add? No, I, that sounds reasonable to me. Um, well, I have good news for you, Kevin. Um, Manomet is uh, working on a standard survey methodology, so we'll be calling you about that to see what you'd like to see in that. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, well, I don't think Dan has been able to join us, Dan Devereaux from Brunswick, and given that I am and I live in Brunswick and I'm um, currently helping the Marine Resources Committee update its ordinance, I will say that a very pressing issue for Brunswick is uh, being able to get landings data down to the shellfish growing area. And I think this is, Kevin, you alluded to, um, you know, what, what resources do we have, uh, where and how much of them? Um, oh, and apparently Susan has joined us. Thank you. Um, so Susan can weigh in on that. Um, Susan Olcott, who's chair of the committee. 
so that is a that's a topic that's not easily solved, but it is one where um, we're exploring and seeing what what opportunities there might be. Susan, if you have something to add, would you do you want to join to to share? Sure. Um, yeah, apologies for jumping on late. I was um, buried in, in snow play. Um, yeah, so I, I would just, I would second that, um, you know, that that's something that, that we have discussed. I know Jessica and I have talked about that and, and even, you know, had a visit with a dealer to go through what, what their experience is and is there a way to get data easily that doesn't put a burden on harvesters um, and that most importantly doesn't divulge any secret information um, about spaces where that they're using, um, financial information that would make people uncomfortable, um, you know, how we can gather it for the resource but not make it a problem for the people who are making a living doing it. Um, so that's something we are struggling with. Um, we, uh, well, I should say I drafted a letter um, from Brunswick to the Department of Marine Resources, um, which we have not sent yet, uh, encouraging them to potentially include another field in the dealer reporting form that would um, include location um, of, of where that harvest is coming from. Um, right now, that information doesn't go on the dealer report. It's only used if there is a, san a self shellfish sanitation issue. So, you know, it that is one way to address the problem. Um, that's something that we would like at some point to share with other towns um, and see if other towns want to kind of use that as a template and send a similar letter. Um, so I'll leave that, you know, to Anne and Jessica to do that whenever it's appropriate. Um, and then I would say the only other thing quick to bring... Thing. We got a lot of people to get through. Oh, yeah, sorry. The only other thing I just wanted to add with Nate um, mentioning conservation opportunities, that is something that we are tackling as part of our task force as well. So just to... We'll try to connect with you on that, Nate, and share what we come up with in terms of meaningful opportunities. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Susan. Um, we're building a good list for the work for next year. Okay, Jessica, do you have a report for Freeport? Oh. I understand, just in time. Yeah, so Charlie Tatro, our warden, couldn't make it tonight, and he sent me an update, and I'm not on the committee. I just happen to live in Freeport and work with them, and I know Corey, um, another harvester, was going to join today, but like many others, is plowing and shoveling out after working all day, so he couldn't make it. So uh, this is on, on Charlie's behalf. He said the harvester report was very positive through the summer and fall, that harvesters were pleased with the volume of the product and price. But due to COVID-19 and large amounts of rainfall, this November and December harvest has been very slow. He said different areas throughout Freeport had set come in um, to market size that had not been harvested in recent years, which is great to see. And he said Freeport still continues to lack any volume of quahog stock and harvest for quahogs was lower than recent years. COVID-19 also put a hold on uh, conservation projects and activities that will hopefully be able to continue in the spring of 2021. So that's the, the Freeport report. All right, thank you. Um, I want to go to uh, Georgetown and Marissa next because um, I understand she won't be able to stay on the call that long. So, and then maybe once we get through all the towns, Dan, we can circle back. We already did Brunswick, but I know you have um, things you'd probably like to add. So uh, Marissa, go ahead. I have a puppy who's been occasionally freaking out in the background, so I apologize if there's some noise. But um, I also, like Jessica, I am not on the Georgetown Shellfish Committee, but I live in Georgetown and I work with them 
quite frequently. Um, so this is sort of an informal update. Um, there hasn't really been much activity in 2020, just simply due to COVID. There hasn't really been many meetings. And so that's put a lot of things on hold, surveys, conservation work, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, sort of an older update, but still relevant. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest issues that Georgetown continues to struggle with is diversification. They really just have soft shell clams. And uh, as you know, in, in, in an effort to sort of address that issue over the past several years, they have transplanted 50,000 adult quahogs into a local cove in Georgetown um, in an effort to sort of create, you know, maybe a self-seeding population or create a new resource. Um, they put some conservation closures on quahogs so that those can't be harvested and they're just there to basically reproduce for now. Um, so really our ongoing efforts with that are just to, you know, monitor um, that, that work and monitor sort of the impact and figure out if we can actually catch any sort of spawning and recruitment events with those quahogs and figure out sort of what the long-term impact of that work is. And maybe if we receive funding, we might try to use uh, fancy new eDNA technology um, to try to help monitor with that work as well. And, and in sort of a more broad sense, figure out if eDNA can be a useful tool for towns to figure out where they can do a lot of that sort of um, stock enhancement work. So, Well, there's a teaser. If I ever heard one, we will have to... Um... Uh, have that as a topic at a future working group meeting that the um, this environmental DNA is a game changer in, uh, in fisheries management and in, in understanding the environment um, in general. Um, thanks, Marissa. So how about we go to uh, Marianne and Harpswell. Hi. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, in Harpswell this year, um, as part of diversification, we were able to receive a grant to build a tidal upweller. And unfortunately, uh, well, not unfortunately, we were able to continue with COVID made a big difference as to the timing of getting the work done. Um, so while we had purchased uh, a supply of Quahog spat, we were growing that out separately. Um, we were able to just about complete the upweller and felt in September that it was a little too late to plant the quahog at that time and over winter. So uh, we, have, we have found a um, place in McCoy Bay with someone there who was willing to um, overwinter the, the um, the product that had been growing uh, for the summer. That was put in on November 1st uh, with the full, and then with thinking we can use the winter to con complete the upweller. It's just about done, but it just wasn't quite ready because of the delay. Um, that was, is the big project for this year. And I'm just looking at the obstacles. Right now, the obstacle course is, um, just what's going on with COVID, but the town uh, has been addressing that with the with the harvesters uh, regarding their residency requirements and their conservation time. Uh, that and they also extended the um, licensing period as well. So um, as far as one shared topic, I'm not sure that I'm in a position <laughs> to, to have that information right now. Normally, Paul Plummer is working with the group uh, and think he, I'm sure he has some ideas of things he would like uh, us to be considering for the future. Thank you. Um, thanks, Marianne. Um, yes, in fact, the upweller topic, uh, and the stock enhancements with Cohogs is, is is a broader issue um, among a number of the communities. And that Dan will have something to say about it, but let's get, because we're running out of time here, to um, Lisa in Arousic. And then Randy, I'm not sure what town you're from. I have to take out my earplugs. Um, Arousic is really small. The town itself has 400 people. And the, um, we have three harvesters generally. They don't actually live in town, the three commercial harvesters. 
Um, so our issues are kind of different. Um, the issue that we have that's the same as everybody else is that the green crabs have eaten all of our, our clams. And um, so the last year our committee, well, in the past our committee has sort of done different things to get people involved with the clam. So um, we, we had a thing called clam camp and we got kids in town, um, you know, all 10 of them, uh, involved in the clams and and we got parents and we get we had like a lot of, uh, of work on that and we also um, worked with Manomet and and put in a clam farm um, with a local clammer who was one of our clammers um, and then as uh, we also do a lot of green crab monitoring and and trapping and measuring and um, uh, so all of that kind of, we we've struggled to do surveys. I was really interested to hear that somebody's looking at doing uh, like a better method for doing surveys or a more um, conclusive method for doing surveys. We have struggled to do the surveys. Um, and our you know, one of our big divides is that we don't actually have clamors in town. So we feel very responsible to them, but it, with the pandemic, uh, honestly, from what we can understand, there actually hasn't been very much digging because our clams are very fragile and they have no, they can be, they can be sold to local restaurants, but when the entire market is out of state or out of town, um, they have no value whatsoever because they have very fragile shells. So um, I think right now, probably what we really need is to sit in on more meetings like this and think about our our next long term strategy, um, we you know we can't run clam camps until everyone can hang out together, um, and that was kind of an interim strategy as we figured out what was going on. Uh, I think what we're we've also explored cohogs and gotten our warrant amended to handle cohogs, <coughs> but mostly. Um, we're trying to figure out just how to keep that clam population there at the foot of the island uh, and um, and how to make sure that the clamors who buy licenses from us uh, can actually make a living. And that, that's our big concern. Um, so I'm kind of interested to sit in and listen to other towns uh, and, and see what they're in, you know, what what they're seeing, because we are a little bit reactive rather than proactive at this point. Well, thank you, Lisa. You're not alone um, in that way, and uh, we're glad you're, you're um, you can participate. Um, we're 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 going over time, but I want to give Dan just a, a minute to talk because the Quahog issue is something he knows a lot about, um, and particularly the stock enhancement using Quahog seed. Um, Dan, do you want to talk about that? Because we covered the the uh, harvest growing. Uh, growing area uh, landings data issue already. Sure. Um, yeah, we um, worked through the summer um, with a grant from the Broad Reach Foundation, similar to the town of Harpswell. Um, uh, we um, grew uh, sub, well, well, one to two millimeter uh, cohogs and floating um, gear at the surface over the course of the summer. Um, we um, just put them down um, to the ocean bottom about, uh, I don't know, um, probably two weeks ago. Um, and uh, we uh, also, uh, we purchased them from the Down East Institute. So um, we were able to um, split our crop and send half of the crop um, that we had uh, growing. Um, up to DEI to have them overwintered. Um, we're not sure um, the, the success of overwintering uh, yet. Um, so uh, instead of losing them all, we split the crop and, and uh, um, cleaned them up and, and sent them up to Brian. So that's where we are with that project. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, on, it's ongoing research locally. Uh, we've done a little, uh, few little anecdotal uh, kind of trials in the last couple of years and um, got some success out of that and the, the, the cohog guidance document and um, all of all of that helps us um, 
kind of uh, believe that this project is going to be successful. So that's all I have, Ian. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, let's uh, suffice to say more to come on that subject over the next year. Um, turn it back to you, Jessica. Thanks. Uh, before we switch topics, I just, we called on people that we know, but if there's anyone who represents a town that hasn't been able to speak yet, um, please unmute and, and let us know. And if not, then we'll just go ahead to the discussion. Okay, all right, I'm not seeing any, any hands up. So this part, uh, we'll have about 15 minutes um, or so to have a discussion about looking forward for next year. So we spent a bit of time looking at those four or five projects that we worked on the last year. And I've heard a few different ideas tonight in terms of looking at the effectiveness of some of the conservation activities that the towns partake in, looking at survey methods, um, looking at the data that shellfish dealers uh, record up to the state, and there's probably a few others that I'm not thinking of, but we want to hear from you. And this is the chance that um, we've heard from some of the folks in each town. If you haven't spoken yet, we'd love to hear from some new folks and then, and then we'll let anyone else who already um, had a suggestion or anyone else who wants to speak to these topics, go ahead and chime in. So the, the three questions are, what are some projects that would really benefit multiple communities in the Casco Bay region that we can work on uh, with a working group. Also for future meetings, um, what speakers would you like to hear from? Last year we had Mark Green come and talk about ocean acidification. Marissa McMahon spoke about uh, green crab, the soft shell market. We had Ivy Frignoka talk about the Maine Climate Council. Uh, we could have people come in and train on different things um, or do field demos next year. And also we have an equipment budget that we haven't been able to tap into yet. And I'd like to hear thoughts on, is there any equipment that we could share among towns that you may not have the budget in your shellfish program, but we can um, hold that equipment and lend it out. And one idea, and Paul Plummer unfortunately is not here from Harpsfall, but their town and a few others use GPS devices when they do shellfish surveys. And these are expensive. Um, and he offered to give us a demo of how they use that and how they can use it for mapping. And that's something that we can purchase a few of those and lend them out to towns if there's interest. So that's one idea. Um, another thing that I'll just throw out there before I turn it over is given the ups and downs in the market and especially everything that's happening in the seafood industry with COVID, if there would be any interest in spending some of that money to develop a wild harvested logo for Casco Bay shellfish that could help differentiate some of your product. And we can share that with the buyers, the shellfish buyers, restaurants, um, retailers. So I'm gonna turn it over to everyone and we'll just ask that in order to be uh, recognized to speak, you can either raise your actual hand and, yeah. and to call on you or if you know how to use the Zoom virtual hand by uh, looking in your participant panel, clicking on that, opening it, and then there should be a little hand icon that you can use. And once we call on you, you can unmute yourself. So I'll open up the floor for any of these topics. And Anne, I can only see a few people since I have my screen shared. So if you could just call on folks, that would be helpful. Well, I have the screen share too, so I have the same limitation, but um, actually I can minimize it. Never mind. People want to hold up their actual hand? Go for it. Dan. I'll start the discussion, Jessica. Um, how much money do you have to spend? <laughs> That's a good question, and I should have checked the budget, but I'm going to throw out... Um, somewhere between two and $3,000. So it's not a huge amount of money, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's something. Well, I, I don't know um, uh, thoughts on this, um, but shared equipment um, 
could be you could you could consider doing a share uh, the towns could consider doing a shared upweller um which would um uh, be be something that um, you could grow smaller seed out to a larger size um and then obviously give it a better uh, fighting chance um, on your own um, because you can purchase smaller seed a lot cheaper than you can um, say from uh, a hatchery that's given you nine, eight, nine, ten millimeter seed because they have to spend all summer or they have to spend a good amount of time growing it out to that. So um, just a thought. Um, I don't know where it would be held or housed and what type of responsibility that would take, but um, that way you could you know, towns could have a silo that, you know, they could grow uh, whatever they were growing in it uh, to a certain point, and then uh, the diggers could spread it out on the flats. Thanks, Dan. Um, I know that there are some towns that are, or not towns that are sharing, but I think in Yarmouth, there might be someone um, who's sharing their upweller for, for commercial aquaculture, but utilize, letting the town utilize it. Is that, did I hear that correct? Is it Keith, I, I'm not sure. I'm. I think Ben had Ben Tupper had mentioned something like that um, when I was down there. It might be Thomas Henninger is an oyster farmer down there uh, that has a, a lot of upwellers, um, and uh, I, I think that that was the offer that he had extended to Yarmouth. Um, we wish we could get that offer in Brunswick. Um, but, uh, um, it's a good offer, um, because it gives your, gives your critters a little jump start before you plant them. So. And did you want to jump in there? Uh, I was just going to fill in what Dan said about, uh, it's Thomas who has offered. We haven't, we haven't taken advantage of it yet, but he's, uh, he and the other, uh, oyster growers in the area are interested in, in, being helpful and collaborating with us. Yeah, and that's, Dan, uh, if I may jump in that this concept of what we call this public-private partnership, right, which is something that you actually did in your Quahog study that you grew out Quahog seed on your lease at Muir Point Oyster that broadcast in the town. And in some cases, uh, the expenses of upfront building an upweller and maintaining it in addition to having to obtain an LPA from the state are um, maybe prohibitive and that, and that sometimes working with a grower that already has one, if they have space, could be a win-win situation and that you could even, you know, pay them rent for a, a few uh, bins in their, in their upweller. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's 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 a great idea as well. Um, and just as soon as Harpswell nails the title up, well, or they, um, I'm sure they'd be willing to share space in that. Um, so, I mean, that's part of the that's part of the project to look at a title up, well, or something that's uh, um, um, not re reliant on um, land uh, energy. Um, so you can just moor it out in a current, and um, the the tide takes care of the the work up wells the critters so yeah good uh, good idea uh, Jess I wish um, I'm not sure that every town in the region has um, a place like Brunswick doesn't have a lot of space for upwellers because we're all mud flats the entire pretty much the entire town is mud flats so um, you know uh, but uh, we certainly uh, be willing to um, join a partnership like that and, and the partnership that you described um, with Mere Point was ex was exactly that that private public partnership where we can use the the knowledge the space the licensure of these oyster farmers that are popping up um, to um, replenish the public flats um, I think that's a, a, a great idea thanks any other thoughts on any of these questions? from folks, especially anyone who hasn't had the chance to weigh in tonight. Kevin had his hand up. I, I, I was just brainstorming an idea that might apply to all three of these bullet points. Um, 
you know, I, I know ongoing searches for water quality is an issue in a number of towns. Is there any type of equipment that anybody's aware of that we could use portably to assess water quality in certain areas when we're going out on the flats looking for leaking pipes, bad water quality? Is anybody aware of that or is there any speakers that we might be able to bring in to talk to us about that? Yeah, I'm wondering if Ari, if she's still Ari Leach from DMR on the meeting, if she wants to add anything to that. Yeah, um, are, Kevin, are you referencing uh, harvesters going out with equipment? Uh, anybody in particular, you know, if you have an area that the water quality is, is starting to diminish, sometimes it's very difficult to isolate that. You know, we take a bunch of samples and then send it off to a lab somewhere and wait to find out if there's, you know, it, what the what the results are. Is there something portable that we can take with us to indicate where these where where we should be focusing our testing on? My inclination, um, I don't work in the water quality department. I have limited knowledge on how they do things, but I do know that. When you collect those samples and send them to us for testing, it's it's quite an involved in lab process. Um, and especially when you're dealing with like point source pollution, I'm assuming you're talking about like um, failing septic pipes and that sort of pollution, not like biotoxin. Um, if there there's nothing that I am aware of that harvesters or other interested individuals could take out with them that would replace what DMR already uses for sampling. And I think you might come up against, um, you know, quality control issues, even if there were some way for harvesters or, um, you know, conservation committees to collect their own samples or data. I'm not sure that those would be accepted. Um, again, like I said, I don't work in water quality, but my, with my limited knowledge, that's my inclination is to say that nothing that is out there would circumvent what DMR already has in place. I may jump in here and I see Judy has her hand up. I'm not sure if it's on this topic, so I'll let you speak, Judy. But just to follow up, I think what Kevin was talking about is helping to identify pollution sources, not necessarily to replace the state monitoring data. And I, there are a mobile water quality monitoring equipment. The YSI is a company that builds a number of different probes that is, you know, it's just like a big long tube with expensive equipment on it. And depending on how much money you have, you can get different monitors. And that does give you, I believe, real time information um, if you have the computer or you can download it. I haven't used one in a while. Um, so that is a possibility. I think we need to look a little bit more into how it, how to use it and what would be appropriate to use for that. But there, there's certainly to just the straightforward answer is that yes, there is mobile water quality um, equipment. And I would be happy to take that inquiry um, to the water quality department if you want some more information from DMR's side. I'd be more than happy. Yeah, that would be great, Ari. And we can we can circle back and, and get back to uh, Kevin and, and talk about this. Sounds good. Okay, uh, Judy, go ahead. Uh, so I was going to add, uh, so you mentioned GPS. And uh, one thing I was going to add is that there's, um, my recommendation would be using a USB GPS that can connect to a, either a phone or an iPad. Um, because then, like, especially with surveys, you could use them, um, you could actually create the survey, you know, on a phone so that all the data gets entered automatically and not on paper first, and use the GPS, and the, the GPS, will, it would just enhance the GPS that people already have on their phones, those are a couple hundred bucks. Um, so that might be one idea um that you that those and then they could just be lent out and people could use them when they're doing something and that could and that would count for regular shellfish surveys but also shoreline surveys all those different kinds of things um 
And because people have asked a lot of questions about pH, maybe some pH meters, if we weren't looking at the whole kit and caboodle, uh, maybe uh, pH meters might be a nice piece of equipment um, that are a little easy, you know, those are a little easier to run and take out in the field. Okay. Um, and train people on. Thanks, Judy. That topic of equipment and pH devices came up in the main ocean and coastal acidification research symposium last week. So I know, I know who to call <laughs> on that one. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more idea and then we're gonna shift to some announcements. So anyone else have ideas? And, and if you would rather not speak up or if you don't have a microphone, you can email me as well. I'll, I'll pop my email in the chat um, box as well. So feel free to send ideas after this too. And uh, do we have any more hands up? Judy still has her hand up, but I'm not sure if she has something new to offer her. She's just one of those perennial hand up people. Okay. All right. Well, I think then um, we can move on to the announcement. So I'll turn it back to you, Anne. Um, and actually, before I do that, I was just checking the chat because there were a few new ones. Um, one person had mentioned about, um, oh, Ruth, <laughs> Ruth Indrick, and I know she's one without a microphone, the Maine Beaches program has good resources on pollution source tracking for fecal bacteria to identify uh, pollution sources. Um, Dan Devereaux said he's not aware of any real-time tests for fecal coliform, but there is the, um, I think, microbial source tracking technology, which you do need to send to a lab to get results back for that. Um, I think, Anne, you might have said eDNA has the potential to help with this, uh, but there's work to be done before it's available to towns. And Bridie uh, mentioned that some towns have used fluorometers to test for optical brighteners that are added to laundry detergent. And it can be a way of figuring out if there's a leaking septic system. All right, well, thank you for all those, those comments. Uh, Judy raised her hand again. Do you have something else to say? Yes, I just forgot there was, I was gonna mention. Uh, so one other thing that might be uh, equipment and you'd have to consider how to do the flying of it, but drones to be used to, to go over the flats. And if those drones collected infrared photography, then you, that's another way to look for pollution sources. Okay. Wow, this is great. Um, well, thank you for all those suggestions. We, our process for both, just so you know what happens next from these ideas is that we take all these great ideas back to our steering committee and narrow them down, look at our criteria well, weigh them against the budget, and then we'll circle back with everyone uh, when we have some some more information. And that's usually when we will do at our next meeting to get more input on that narrowed list. Um, so now I'm going to go into announcements and turn it back to Anne. Thanks, Jessica. Um, funding opportunity. You, I hope, are all aware that the main shellfish sustainability and resilience uh, fund is open again for proposals. This is uh, broad reach fund, which is, um, you know, this program's just been a shot in the arm for shellfish communities up and down the coast. Um, the uh, fund supports projects that improve the management and conservation of clam fat flats and mussel beds. Harvester involvement is a priority and proposals are due January 19th, 2021. So uh, not, not, um, it's very soon. And if anyone wants help uh, preparing a proposal, um, just send us an email. I guess we should put our emails in the chat, Jessica. Yeah, uh, can do and that. I should note that the uh, Broadreach Fund also um, funds the um, activities of the working group. So we're uh, very grateful to them for, for everything they're doing for Maine's shellfish uh, community. Um, Maine Climate Council update, uh, as you probably all heard, the Climate Action Plan was approved and the 
next steps are that the governor's office will work with um, the with Maine's um, legislature to advance the goals of the plan. And there, there are a lot of strategies in there that are relevant to the shellfish community. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get information out to, to the wor our working group email list when issues come before the Marine Resources Committee and the legislature that relate to um, the shellfish industry. And just quickly, they've proposed creating a Maine Seafood Business Council to, to assist with marketing, um, looking at the vulnerability of infrastructure, uh, docks and piers and so on, um, creating a coastal and marine information exchange we're ahead of our time here with the working group, with the, with the database, um, and providing technical assistance and funding to communities to support local and regional climate resilience initiatives, in which I would say that um, diversification of shellfish resources would be high on that list. Um, so uh, I want to turn it over to Bridie, because she has an announcement about the Maine Shellfish Learning Network. Righty. Great, thanks, Anne. Um, Katie Mistips and the introductions. I'm Bridie McGreevy. I'm a faculty member in communication journalism at University of Maine, project lead with the Maine Shellfish Learning Network, and I'm also chair of the Science Advisory Committee for the Maine Shellfish Restoration and Resilience Fund. So I appreciated um, you sharing that announcement. And just wanted to emphasize that the Learning Network is also a source of support if you want to brainstorm project ideas. The proposals are really short. They're a maximum of somewhere around three pages. Um, and, and these can really be a, a great way of um, building capacity for the work that you want to do in your town. This is not to put pressure on, but uh, the reality is we don't know if this fund is going to be available in future years. So if you have a project idea, um, we recommend that you move on it this year if, if you can. Um, so please reach out and let us know if we can support that in any way. And then I'm also happy to announce that we have published a new website called themudflat.org. This is a collaborative website that has been a long time in the making. It actually started several years ago with a related project called Clam Cam. So this is distinct from Clam Camp, <laughs> where we're actually working with clammers um, where they were using GoPro cameras. Um, to document how clamming works and where it happens and the, the digging practices. Clammers told us that they were interested in having a way of raising awareness about what it takes to get clams from the mud to market to plate. Um, and so you could type in clam cam and check that out, but as we were developing this with harvesters, they also mentioned that while clam cam was useful for giving the window into clamming, they wanted to have a website that would more fully connect clamming with co-management and provide the, the scientific and technical and cultural information that's really valuable as part of this context. Um, so that's what the, the mud flat has become. And we're still in a phase of getting feedback from people. So we're really interested in hearing from you about to what extent is this useful? Are there other, other um, sources of information that we could feature there? Are you producing documents that you want to archive? Can we link to your projects? So please reach out and let us know if you have any recommendations for how to continue to build this site. One thing I'll mention is that we've started to build a series of project profiles. So if you wanted to do some additional brainstorming about different projects that you might work on within your town, we're, we're putting some information there to help, um, help in that brainstorming. So feel free to reach out. Let me know if you have any feedback. Thanks. Thanks, Bridie. Did you want to mention the uh, Maine Water and Sustainability Conference too? Yeah, um, <laughs> let me pull that up. Um, the Maine Sustainability and Water Conference uh, is held every year the last week in March. Um, and it's gonna be virtual this year um, and held between March 31st and April 1st. Um, there's usually between four and 500 people in attendance. And it's a great way of um, connecting with people across sectors. So a lot of people from state agencies go, 
municipalities, um, uh, nonprofit organizations, researchers. It's very interdisciplinary. There's an increasing focus on shellfish and coastal issues. Uh, and so I would encourage you to check that out. Thanks, Brady. If, if there are any other announcements, feel free to put them in the chat or we actually have another minute or so if anyone else has other announcements that might be relevant to this group. You can just unmute yourself and go for it. Hi, this is Jay McCray. I just wanted to mention that because of what's happening in the world with the pandemic that a lot of our the committee meetings at the start, all the committee meetings at the start will be remote. So my hope is that makes it even easier for people to weigh in on bills or give information in briefing. So please, please feel free to join and educate us. Thank you. Thank you. And those who might have missed, um, Representative McCrate, are you are you on the Marine Resource Committee? I believe you are, right? So the, the state legislative committees is what she's talking about. And maybe we can send out a link on how to sign up for email announcements. So then you get uh, all the proposed uh, legislation and bills in your inbox and you can decide which ones you can uh, tune into. So thank yeah. you. If, if you go to maine.gov interested parties, you can sign up to get that information from any of the committees you're interested in. And then you'll be sorry because you'll get a lot of email. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we have a couple minutes to go and we just have our, our last wrap up slide. So we're gonna end on time today, which is great. Uh, I did wanna mention following up on what Kevin shared these presentations, they are available on our website. They're right under the meetings and announcements uh, below all the information for today's meeting, which will soon be shifted over into past meetings. So it should be really at the top of the left column there. We have the PDFs posted for these. And because we want towns to tailor them, you have to email us and we'll share the actual PowerPoint template and the Microsoft Word template for the handout. And if you are not, um, or someone on your shellfish or marine resource committee doesn't like public speaking and would rather have some help uh, presenting these resources to your town council or board of selectmen, Ann and I um, would be happy to do that, um, especially since really it just means popping on a computer these days instead of driving out to a meeting, which is not the same, but um, certainly a little easier to access. I'm sure Kevin would help too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the shellfish databa database needs assessment survey that I mentioned is going to have several components. We're going to have an online survey. We also have a few of us on the project team, including um, Madeline and Ann and I and uh, Judy. Actually, we contracted with her uh, GIS firm to help us with this. We'll also be calling uh, individuals who would rather speak to a person on the phone than fill out something online. And we can also attend shellfish committee meetings to get input from your whole committee at one time rather than from individuals. So we'll be launching that, we're hoping by the end of uh, January and it'll be open for at least a month. So just look out for that. We'll be emailing uh, separate in towns for that, so individually. Uh, for this meeting, as we usually do, we'll prepare a meeting summary that we'll post on the webpage and also a recording of the webinar. Our next meeting, uh, we don't know when that's going to be, <laughs> um, at least in a couple of months. And one thing that we are considering, given that uh, not everyone wants to join a meeting period, let alone one online, uh, we may try to just do one more virtual meeting uh, this winter or spring and then try to save up some, some planning time when we can meet in person again, hopefully uh, late spring or early summer, depending on um, vaccines and weather, right? So we'll be in touch on that and I'll see if Anne has anything else to add, but I just really wanted to thank you all for showing up tonight. Back to my first slide is that 
Um, if you want to be heard and, and you want progress on some of these issues, you, you have to show up. So thank you for doing that. And Anne, uh, do you have anything else to add? Um, just um, add my thanks to everybody. You know, I learned something, many things, uh, every time we have one of these meetings. And I'm so grateful for all of you for sharing um, what you've shared. And um, just uh, be careful of shoveling while the snow's pretty light. So, um, but also, um, we hope you have a safe, underlined safe um, holidays. And we'll see you in the new year. Yeah, happy holidays, happy shoveling, plowing. I know a lot of people were out doing that today. Um, enjoy the snow at this point. I'm excited to get out there and, and play in the snow too. So, all right. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Happy holidays. Thank you.